Hello, we're glad you've joined us for this live webinar, Optimizing Antimicrobial Stewardship by Combining Multiplex PCR and Biomarker Results in Patients with Sepsis. I'm Susie Valdez of LabRoots, and I'll be moderating this session. Today's educational web seminar is presented by LabRoots, the leading scientific social networking website and provider of virtual events and webinars advancing scientific collaboration and learning. It's brought to you today by BioMurio, a world leader in the field of in vitro diagnostics for over 55 years. BioMurio is present in 43 countries and serves more than 160 countries with the support of a large network of distributors. BioMurio provides diagnostic solutions, systems, reagents, software, and services which determine the source of disease and contamination to improve patient health and ensure consumer safety. Its products are mainly used for diagnosing infectious diseases and some critical illnesses. The company's diagnostic solutions are also used for detecting microorganisms in agri-food, pharmaceutical, and cosmetic products. To learn more about them, visit them at www.biomeriux.com. Let's get started. You can pose questions to the speaker today during the presentation while they're fresh in your mind. To do so, simply type them into the drop-down box located on the far left of your screen labeled Ask a Question and click the Send button. Questions will be answered after the presentation. To enlarge the slide window, click on the arrows at the top right-hand corner of the presentation window. If you experience any tip, technical problems, seeing or hearing this presentation, just click on the support tab found at the top right of the presentation window or report your problem by typing it into the ask a question box located on the far left of your screen. This is an educational webinar and thus offers free continuing education credits. Simply click on the continuing education credits tab located at the top right of your presentation window and follow the process for obtaining your credits. Without further ado, I now present today's speaker, Dr. John Bareko. Dr. Bareko is the co-director of the Antimicrobial Stewardish Program at the Clinical Infectious Diseases Pharmacist at Duke Regional Hospital in Durham, North Carolina. Dr. Bareko is the co-director of the Antimicrobial Stewardship Program and the Clinical Infectious Disease Pharmacist at the hospital, and he received his doctorate of pharmacy at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill at the Board Certified Infectious Disease Pharmacist. Dr. Bareko has been utilizing biomarkers and diagnostics for more than 10 years and spearheaded the implementation and education at his hospital. Dr. Bareko will now begin his presentation. Welcome, sir. Thank you, Susie, for that nice introduction. And uh, thank you to Bia Miriu, who uh, is a large supporter of all uh, antibiotic stewardship uh, programs around the world. Uh, my disclosure, obviously, Bia Miriu is sponsoring this presentation. So the objectives for today, we're going to examine how biomarkers and multiplex PCR assist in the diagnosis of sepsis. We're also going to examine how these results can benefit patient care when used in conjunction with an antibiotic stewardship program. So let's start off with the patient case. We have a 62-year-old male who was admitted from a skilled nursing facility with cough and hypoxia. Past medical history is consistent for uh, coronary artery disease, status post a cabbage. He has AFib, which is controlled by warfarin. He has an aortic valve replacement and pneumonia seven months prior to uh, admission. His vital signs for the temperature is 36.7, heart rate 78, respiration is 28, and a blood pressure of 89 over 55. His labs are notable for a white count of 16.8, platelets of 130, and his INR is currently 3.4. His goal in the home setting or his skilled facility is 2 to 3. Biomarkers, procalcitonin is 40.28. His previous values uh, seven to 12 months ago were uh, negative at less than 0.01 nanograms per mil. He's posted for ICU admission with septic shock. 
Antibiotics are initiated in the emergency room, vancomycin and tiptazo. Microbiology, urinary antigens are normal. His urine was mixed. His blood showed two out of two Pseudomonas species via the BioFire film array system. Patient outcome, uh, we will examine in a few slides. So let's look at the burden of antibiotic use in the hospital setting. This is a slide that just about everybody uses in every presentation, whether it be on sepsis, mortality, or antibiotic stewardship. Uh, the CDC estimates that each year in this country, 2 million people in the U.S. acquire an infection while hospitalized, resulting in 90,000 deaths. And approximately 20 to 50 percent of antibiotics prescribed in U.S. acute care hospitals are unnecessary or inappropriate. When we look at the epidemiology of sepsis uh, in quick care medicine, uh, Dombrowski and colleagues uh, estimated that from uh, 1993 to 2003, uh, the severe sepsis cases increased continuously from about 25 percent to almost 44 percent. And that for that same time period, the age adjusted rates for severe sepsis hospitalizations and mortality increased annually by 8.2% for hospitalizations and 5.6% for uh, mortality. And then uh, Martin in the New England Journal of Medicine estimates that greater than 750,000 cases of sepsis occur annually in the United States, and it accounts for 11% of all ICU admissions. Looking at mortality of sepsis, uh, sepsis contributes to one in every two to three hospital deaths with most sepsis already present upon admission and most common cause of death in the non-coronary ICUs. Of all the uh, sources of infection, the respiratory tract is the most common and associated with the highest mortality rate. And after onset of septic shock, Mortality increases for every hour of delayed treatment by 7.6% per hour. So this was an excellent study by Seymour in the New England Journal of Medicine. They wanted to look at the time to treatment and mortality during an emergency room care for sepsis. So what they did was they uh, examined patients with presumed sepsis and or septic shock uh, between April of 2014 and June of 2016. Uh, their outcome was to assess the association between the time until completion of a three-hour bundle and risk-adjusted mortality. They also examined the time to the appropriate administration of the antibiotics in the initial fluid bolus. They were pretty robust. They looked at over 49,000 patients and I guess, thankfully, 82.5% uh, of the patients completed their three-hour bundle within three hours. Uh, the median time to completion of the three-hour bundle was 1.3 hours, antibiotic administration 0.9 hours, and the initial fluid bowl was 2.56 hours. So as far as results, uh, the sepsis bundle completed within three or after three hours but less than 12 hours had a statistically significant increase risk adjusted in hospital mortality. Mortality, the odds ratio 1.04, uh, the longer time to give antibiotics, also a risk or odds ratio of 1.04, and less so for fluid boluses with an odds ratio of 1.01. So their conclusion, a more rapid completion of a three-hour bundle of sepsis care and rapid administration of antibiotics, but not the rapid completion of an initial bolus of IV fluids were associated with lower risk-adjusted in hospital mortality. These are also results. Uh, again, this forest plot looks at in-hospital deaths less likely to the left of the uh, line and more likely to the right of the line. And you can see that overwhelmingly that uh, in-hospital death was more likely uh, with the adjusted odds ratio for not meeting that three-hour sepsis bundle.
This is just a, 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 a graphic form of the same information uh, in hospital mortality and then time to completion. So you can see uh, when you complete it within three hours, you have a, a much less both risk adjusted and crude mortality rate. Same thing with administration of antibiotics. Within three hours, crude mortality and risk adjusted mortality statistically less significant. And there's the fluid bolus, which shows that uh, if you don't meet that three hour bundle, there was really no change in either crude mortality or risk adjusted mortality. So let's look at procalcitonin. Uh, it's produced in the C cells of the thyroid gland. Uh, bacterial infections uh, basically stimulate procalcitonin production uh, via interleukins, TNF alphas. Uh, with a non-bacterial infection, uh, a virus will secrete gamma interferon, which actually uh, inhibits the production of procalcitonin. Uh, we know concentrations greater than 0 0.25 nanograms uh, can indicate significant bacterial infections, and studies have shown that levels greater than 2 nanograms per mil indicated high risk of severe sepsis or septic shock. Understanding procalcitonin when you compare it with other biomarkers, we know that TNF-alpha and interleukin-6 and 10 peak almost immediately, but then decrease, and that would be uh, responsible for a patient who might uh, come to the emergency room a little later after the initial bacterial infection. Uh, CRP is the dark green line, and that usually takes about six hours to begin peaking, uh, but then stays elevated. Uh, the issue with CRP is that uh, it does not differentiate between bacterial and viral infections and just uh, is indicative of inflammation within the lung. Uh, procalcitonin starts to peak or starts its ascent about two hours and will continue peaking until appropriate antibiotics are administered. And then stays until about 24 hours and then with its half-life of 24 hours will uh, start its decline. Now, why is this important? Well, we already know that we're trying to attain uh, the three-hour sepsis bundle. So if we were just going to rely on CRP, uh, we may not uh, have started the peak yet and be unaware that the patient may or may not be going into sepsis. But a quicker biomarker like procalcitonin may give you a slight edge as far as identifying that patient who is heading towards sepsis. Understanding procalcitonin kinetics uh, usually rises again between three and six hours after the initial uh, infection. Obviously, it's patient independent, so it's going to be different in each patient as they come through your emergency room. Normally, it peaks between 12 and 24 hours, and with a half life of 24 hours, you would expect with appropriate antibiotics uh, that you would have a, about a 50% decrease in the procalcitonin value. This is important for stewardship programs. We know that if on day two your procalcitonin has not decreased by about 50% or it has gone up, you'll need to examine whether or not your antibiotic regimen is appropriate or if there's another source of infection that you haven't identified. But if antibiotics are adequate, you should expect that 50% decline in the procalcitonin from the baseline that was obtained in the emergency room. Uh, Dr. Phil Schutz did an excellent Cochrane systematic review back in 2012, and his uh, primary outcome was all-cause mortality and treatment failure at 30 days. His secondary outcomes, antibiotic use, antibiotic-related adverse effects, and length of stay. And here's the results. He looked at over 6,700 patients and between the procalcitonin group and the control group, um, mortality was slightly less but not statistically significant for the procal group. Treatment failure was not statistically different. And in subgroup analysis, they found no difference. But antibiotic use 
and adverse effects were statistically significantly less when you followed a procalcitonin guided antibiotic uh, logarithm. And length of stay and ICU stay, uh, there was no difference between the two groups. So his conclusions, when you use a procalcitonin guided therapy versus a controlled group, you have lower risk of mortality, lower antibiotic consumption, and a lower risk for antibiotic-related side effects. Uh, the good thing about this Cochrane review was that our results were similar for different clinical settings. So this was both outpatient clinics, emergency rooms, uh, medical floors, and intensive care units, and in all types of acute respiratory infections. So he looked at all forms of lower respiratory and upper respiratory tract infections. So how do we use procalcitonin in an antibiotic stewardship team? In our hospital, we use it in the emergency room as a test of exclusion in patients with presumed LRTIs. Um, that's not where this conversation is going uh, this afternoon, but that is one of the reasons that we use it. Uh, we do use it to, again, uh, hopefully not initiate antibiotics or stop antibiotics after just one dose in anybody with an exacerbation of asthma, bronchitis, COPD, and congestive heart failure. Uh, interestingly enough, the recent CAP guidelines uh, recommended not using procalcitonin in community-acquired pneumonia. Um, basically, if you had clinical suspicion that your patient did have uh, an infectious CAP, that not to use procalcitonin to exclude using antibiotics. That is absolutely correct, but worded strangely. You can still use procalcitonin, but you would never use that negative procalcitonin in the presence of, uh, in the presence of CAP side effects uh, and not initiate antibiotics. Um, so how are we gonna use it today? In the emergency room, we'll use it as a baseline value in patients with presumed sepsis. So in our ICU or our internal medicine patients, uh, we will use that as a guide to de-escalate antibiotics in culture-negative patients. So again, we'll get our baseline in the emergency room. We'll identify that they potentially are heading towards sepsis, which means we could initiate the three-hour sepsis bundle sooner. On day two, if that procalcitonin is 50% or less from day one, uh, we know that we're going in the right direction. And on day three, if that procalcitonin is 80% of day one and your patient is culture negative, then we know that we can de-escalate antibiotics. So there are some limitations to procalcitonin. The absolute limitations are people with end-stage renal disease, renal cell carcinoma, thyroid cancers, and severe burns and trauma. There are some relative um, limitations. Uh, in our hospital, we did a one-year study and found that patients with CKD3 and CKD4 also had similarly uh, falsely elevated procalcitonins. Uh, Non-small uh, cell lung cancer with or without lobectomy is also a relative um, limitation. AKI, very difficult to quantify. Uh, we don't know if the AKI is using the vanc zosin combination, um, if it's coming from untreated sepsis. Uh, so it's really difficult to superimpose the timeline uh, when procalcitonin is going to increase but yet it's falsely increased because of the AKI. So that's an opportunity for further studies down the road. So this is a sepsis algorithm for procalcitonin antibiotic use. And the first thing you'll notice is that it's uh, basically all the values are twice as high as for LRTI sepsis algorithm. Uh, so if you're uh, less than 0.25 nanograms per mil, uh, that we know that uh, cessation is strongly encouraged. Uh, or if you're between 0.25 and 0.49, that cessation is encouraged. 
Uh, once you're above 0 0.5, uh, then cessation is discouraged or strongly discouraged based on the number. So Ranch and uh, the BMC uh, notes, um, he looked at procalcitonin to predict mortality in patients with sepsis. And his line of demarcation was seven nanograms per mil. So the green line would represent um, procalcitonin less than seven. And of course, his survival uh, was greater than those who had a procalcitonin greater than seven nanograms per mil. And this is just a, a box plot to show the same thing. The lower your procalcitonin, uh, the greater your survivor is. And we've seen this in our hospital time and time again. We know that uh, once your procalcitonin is greater than two nanograms per mil, uh, that sepsis is likely. And the higher you go, the greater the microbial burden and the higher your mortality rate potentially will be. So this is our other um, biomarker we're using. It's um, a faster actionable, or FA, uh, the biofire. It's a blood culture identification, or the BCID panel. Uh, we know when we look at traditional blood cultures, we need to wait for the blood culture to turn positive, which depending on the organism is anywhere between 12 and 72 hours. Uh, when you use standard testing, pathogen identification, usually within 24 to 72 hours, and then you still have to await antimicrobial susceptibility testing. But with the BCID panel and gram stain, uh, we know that we could uh, decrease the time uh, compared to traditional modes by 70%, and that's 57.4 uh, hours for the standard 17.2 hours for the BCID method. And I'm going to show you some data from our hospital towards the end of the presentation uh, that pretty much matches um, those numbers. So is BCID effective? Is it sensitive? Is it specific? That's something that's very important for stewardship teams. It's nice to bring in a test but if it's not going to give you actionable data that we could actually bring upstairs to the patient, uh, we need to work on that. So this was a, a great study by uh, Pardo in uh, Diagnostic Microbial Infectious Disease. Uh, he wanted to look at the clinical and economic impact of antibiotic stewardship interventions using the BCID panel. Uh, of course, this was a pre and a post cohort, uh, so cohort comparison. Uh, evaluated the effect of BCID implementation versus standard of care without a BCID. And he mainly looked at coag negative staff and MISA. Uh, so his results, uh, BCID results facilitated earlier discontinuation of Vanco when GPCs and clusters were identified as either coag or MISA. So the left side of that table is just for MISA alone. And, you know, un understandably, the, that number is pretty low. It's only 32 patients, uh, but it's at least a snapshot to help us out. So, of course, the control group would be without BCID, and the BCID would be with it. Uh, the good news is that out of all the patients, 100% started vancomycin for uh, GPCs and clusters. Uh, but remarkably, uh, only half of the patients in the BCID group got more than one dose. Uh, whereas a considerable amount got uh, or did not get just one dose. And when you look at the median duration of antibiotic use in the control group, it was 66 hours. Uh, the BCID group was 14 hours. And those last two items were uh, statistically significant. When you go over to the COAG negative staff side, uh, again, a fair amount of patients received uh, vancomycin. Uh, I guess kudos to the stewardship and the physician teams for those hospitals uh, because that means they understand that with rapid diagnostics that they don't have to jump on a lab saying that, hey, we got one out of two GPCs and clusters and they didn't start vancomycin. So hopefully we can bring that 72 and that 70 down a little bit farther. Uh, and of course, one dose only uh, was uh, 
just about the same and not statistically significant, and the median duration of antibiotic therapy. Uh, although it was uh, statistically less in the BCID group, it was not statistically significant because of a lack of power. So when we look at um, procalcitonin, when we look at three pluses, that means that the calcitonin is most likely to be positive uh, and we know it's definitely for pneumonia, both upper and lower respiratory tract. Uh, we know for meningitis that procalcitonin is expected to be quite high. And severe sepsis and septic shock, procalcitonin will be uh, inordinately high. As far as, uh, you know, still positive, it would be the LRTIs, so your bronchitis, COPD, pulmonary fibrosis, and asthma. Congestive heart failure is on there, but the caveat, only severe congestive heart failure will cause procalcitonin to uh, rise. So if your patient has chronically stable CHF, you would expect a negative procalcitonin, which might allow you to discontinue antibiotics since the shortness of breath is probably secondary to fluid overload. And procalcitonin is definitely positive in abdominal infections and pancreatitis. And in our hospital, we're noticing that it's also positive with C. diff infections. Um, they list urinary tract infections as positive, but in our hospital, that's only true if you have a concomitant bacteremia or if it's a pyelonephritis where you have more tissue involvement than urine. So let's go back to our patient. If we had used standard microdetection, uh, from the time of the blood collection to the gram stain result, uh, depending on, again, the organism, uh, anywhere from 18 to 30 hours. From the time of the gram stain result to the pathogen ID, another 6 to 24 hours. And from the time of the pathogen ID to a sensitivity report, 12 to 24 hours. But fortunately, our hospital uses the BCID panel. So from the time of blood collection to vancomycin discontinuation, 26 hours. From the time of the gram stain result to the pathogen ID, it was only 8.5 hours. And from the time of the pathogen ID with sensitivities to narrowing of therapy, two hours. So final look at our patient. Uh, on day three, he was on day three of appropriate therapy with Piptazo who's clinically stable with return to baseline. All vital signs and laboratory parameters were within normal limits. He was posted for discharge to continue oral antibiotic therapy to complete a seven-day course. So what's the importance and applicability of using fast and actionable diagnostics in hospitalized patients? Um, at ID Week this past October in Washington, uh, there was a great quote that I cannot take credit for. Uh, but the clinician basically said, if a rapid diagnostic result falls in the forest, basically a metaphor for if nobody looks at the result, if it's not actionable, if it's not paired with a robust antibiotic stewardship, uh, then rapid diagnostics lose some of their uh, sensitivities. So we know uh, from our previous conversations that uh, using rapid diagnostics, uh, we can decrease resistance. Uh, we can decrease adverse events associated with antimicrobials. We can decrease cost to hospital pharmacy departments and hopefully improve patient outcomes. So let's look at antibiotic resistance. This is a, a chart with a fluoroquine uh, resistance for pseudomonas. And you can see, unfortunately, that blue line is uh, a direct increase uh, from overuse of quinolones, um, from feeding uh, cows and chickens antibiotics, which include quinolones, uh, which gives uh, us drug-resistant uh, mutations that are in our stomach. Uh, so just overuse of quinolones is causing uh, most uh, quinolones, especially ciprofloxacin, to be uh, basically ineffective in most infections in this country. Same thing, the CDC and WHO, uh, they've listed the various organisms as either um, urgent, critical, serious. Uh, for CRE, that's both urgent and critical, uh, with an estimated death 600 per year. 
uh, Acinetobacter is also serious and critical uh, with up to 500 deaths per year. Um, ESBL, which we're seeing a lot of in, in our hospital these days, uh, that's serious and critical. Uh, I would say that in our hospital, I now consider it uh, urgent and critical uh, with as much as 1,700 deaths. Uh, VRE, serious and high. Pseudomonas uh, is serious and critical. Uh, MRSA is serious and high. And uh, fluconazole-resistant candida is also serious. And uh, who did not um, acknowledge uh, that particular bug? So nothing on that table. So our first point was uh, we can decrease antibiotic-associated adverse events. So this was a great study by TAMA in uh, JAMA Internal Medicine in 2017. It was a cohort study which examined 1,488 patients uh, for 30 days after initiation of antibiotic therapy. And they found that 20% experienced at least one antibiotic-associated ADE. 20% of non-clinically indicated antibiotic regimens were associated with an ADE, including C. difficile infection. And for every additional 10 days of therapy, there was a 3% risk of an ADE. And not uncommon, the most common adverse drug events were gastrointestinal, renal, and hematological. And when you look at emergency room uh, visits, uh, antibiotics are still in the top four for reasons for presentation. Uh, they are right up there with um, opioids and anti-diabetic agents. So these are not benign substances. Uh, Luther and critical care medicine also looked at adverse effects. Uh, this was a systematic review and meta-analysis. Uh, he was assessing acute kidney injury with combination therapy of vancpiptazo in adults and in critically ill patients. So his primary outcome was to uh, examine the rates of AKI and the time to AKI. And he looked at the odds of AKI, and he compared three different cohorts, vancomycin monotherapy, uh, vanc plus cefepime and or carbapenem, and then peptazo monotherapy. And when you look at uh, the four cohorts, you can see that overwhelmingly bank peptazo combination had the greatest percentage with AKI. So we've known that for uh, several years now that that combination does increase uh, AKI. And at our hospital, at least, we're starting to go more and more with the bank. Uh, cefepime metronidazole combination, uh, which has been known to decrease AKI incidence. This is just a forest plot. Uh, this is vanc piptazo versus vanc cefepime, and they're measuring how soon to AKI. And as you can see, it overwhelmingly uh, favors in a not so favorable. Uh, moment of uh, bank piptazo is causing quicker AKI in your patients. This is also uh, bank by itself versus bank piptazo. And again, the forest plot uh, shows you that the bank piptazo combination uh, causes AKI more than just vancomycin monotherapy. When you look at the vanc cefepime or vanc marrow versus vanc piptazo, again, vanc piptazo combination uh, causes more AKI. And lastly, when looking at monotherapy with piptazo versus vanc piptazo combinations, again, we know who wins in this one. And these are the adverse events. Uh, the comparator versus the vanc piptazo. And any of the other three comparators have better kidney profiles than the combination of vanc and piptazo. As far as decreased costs, let's just do the math, right? If we uh, prescribe fewer antibiotics, if we consume less antibiotics, uh, that's fewer antibiotics that uh, our purchaser has to uh, write a check out for. So, 
you know, it's proof positive that when we're using less antibiotics that uh, it's a win-win situation uh, for the hospital and the hospital pharmacy department. Now, what we need to do is convince all the executives out there that the micro lab also results in significantly decreased costs. Uh, we're just always hearing that the micro lab is too expensive, you know, that all these uh, fast diagnostics are prohibitively expensive and we need to educate and change how we do and rewrite computer programs. But bottom line is with uh, fast diagnostics, uh, the micro lab saves hospitals hundreds of thousands of dollars per year. All right, what about reduce, reduced antibiotic exposure and mortality? Uh, this was a, a great study in Lancet Infectious Disease in 2016. Um, again, two cohorts were the procalcitonin guided antibiotic regimens versus standard of care antibiotic regimens. And you can see antibiotic consumption in days. So daily defined doses in the first 28 days were statistically in favor of uh, procalcitonin. Duration of antibiotic therapy were also statistically in favor of procalcitonin. And the antibiotic free days in the first 28 days also favored procalcitonin. When you looked at mortality, and when you looked at one-year mortality, there was no statistical significance. But when we're using fast diagnostics to de-escalate antibiotics, if we can maintain the same mortality both at 28 days and one year or whatever time period you want to look at, uh, that's a winning situation because you would normally expect intuitively that, you know, I'm using less antibiotics. I would expect some deleterious effects where my patient may be at increased risk of mortality, but I haven't seen a study that has shown that yet. And this is another study. Uh, it's a procalcitonin guided antibiotic therapy from other selected meta analyses. And you can see that uh, it's over 20,000 patients, and basically looking at mortality and antibiotic uh, duration. In all five of those analyses, uh, antibiotic duration was statistically decreased, and in mortality, three out of the five studies showed a decrease in mortality, and two of the studies, no change in mortality. So patient outcomes continued. Uh, this is a, a, a snapshot study for our hospital. It's uh, pending an IRB. And our primary outcome was uh, time to narrow antimicrobial therapy. So the use of fast and actionable, uh, where's my results? Sorry about that. Let's go to the previous slide. Oh, there we go. Uh, so our snapshot results, um, our medium time to narrow antimicrobial therapy was 18.7 hours. Uh, that's uh, at least one half of what one would expect, and in some instances it was as much as uh, one third of what we would expect. So, you know, those results are just uh, good outcomes for the hospital, good outcomes for the patient. Uh, we are going away from combination therapy and narrowing to appropriate therapy. Uh, in light speed. Uh, we're doing it within, sometimes within 20, within 24 hours to get to the absolute appropriate antibiotic, which is um, really just a, 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 great, a great thing for the patient. And, you know, again, we really appreciate all these fast diagnostics that are coming through to help stewardship teams and hospitals and our patients. So what are our take-home points? We already know that the use of fast and actionable diagnostic has the ability to significantly reduce time on broad spectrum antibiotics. You know, we're going from 72 to 96 hours uh, down to uh, 17 to 30 hours. Uh, we already know that if intuitively, if we are stepping away from broad spectrum antibiotics, that we have the ability to decrease antibiotic resistance. We already know that the less antibiotics you consume, uh, that the adverse events are less likely to occur. We already know that it saves money, and we already know that from a mortality benefit, uh, it improves patient outcomes. 
with that, I turn it over to the moderator for um, any questions you might have for me. Thank you so much, Dr. Bareko, for that presentation. And a quick reminder for our audience on how to submit questions. Simply type them into the drop-down box located on the far left of your presentation window labeled Ask a Question, and then just click on the Send button. Dr. Bareko will answer as many questions as we have time today. So let's take a look at our first audience questions coming in, Dr. Bareko. Our first one is, do you have to confirm CRE? Well, it's, uh, you do need to uh, uh, confirm it. Um, our micro lab right now runs uh, CRE enzymes, and that's one of the uh, more advantages of, of the biofire that, you know, right now they only look at three resistance mechanisms, uh, but they're going to significantly expand that uh, within the next several months. Uh, they also look at just a certain number of gram positives, gram negatives, and fungals, but that's also going to be expanded significantly. So we're actually going to get more positive reads on different antimicrobials, but which also include the uh, resistance enzymes. Thank you for that, Dr. Barico. Our next question is, what is the turnaround time for PCT and the BCID panel? Okay, uh, we put our procalcitonin in the chemistry lab because it was a 24-7 operation, and it's also used uh, from the same blood tube uh, as the BMP. Uh, so what happens is the tube goes to our uh, chemistry lab, uh, they do their BMP, and then they immediately send it over to the procalcitonin machine. Uh, if we run it stat, we get the results within one hour. If we run it routine, we get it within two hours. So that is definitely an actionable number that we can use in our hospital. Uh, BCID, we, need, we still need to wait for the blood culture to uh, go positive, uh, but then the identification is within hours. Uh, it's, it's really pretty amazing. Uh, it's, it's making my job as a steward uh, so much easier because you know, now I just have the evidence behind it uh, to rapidly de-escalate antibiotics and then further narrow after we get the sensitivity pattern and the MICs back. Thank you. And again, thank you to our audience members. We have some great questions coming in. Our next one is, we are noticing PCT rising for the first 24 hours on antibiotics and then dropping. Can you address that? Well, um, it, it depends when the patient presents from the initial bacterial insult. Uh, not all people are going or patients are going to follow that timeline. Uh, 24 hours would be a bit much to wait for a peak. Uh, you know, normally we see it peak anywhere from two to eight hours. Uh, about 90% of our patients peak between that uh, time frame. Um, Again, whenever it goes up, we're a little concerned that we don't have the right antibiotics. But, you know, with the 24-hour half-life, uh, maybe for that particular patient, uh, it just took longer for them to respond to the antibiotics, allowing the procalcitonin to start its decline. Thank you. And <clears throat> here's the next question. Um, how reliable is procalcitonin when peaking within the first 24 to 48 hours of presentation, but after antibiotics have been initiated? Oh, we've had several patients who we thought we had the right antibiotic or we thought we had the uh, source of the infection, uh, but yet it just, the procalcitonin was not appropriately declining. Uh, so we just uh, maybe enhanced our antibiotics a little bit and maybe did some more diagnostics, uh, some scanning or imaging or CT scanning to maybe identify another source of infection that we hadn't identified. Because, you know, if you, if you don't have source control, um, the antibiotics are going to take longer to uh, bring down the microbial burden, which would, uh, you know, enhance or take the, the procalcitonin would take longer to decline. Thank you. And 
are there studies that show evidence of reduction of antibiotics using causing antibiotics use causing a reduction in the incident of antibioresistance? Uh, that's more, yeah, that, 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 that's more global. Um, we theoretically know that using Procal or BCID, that as fast as we could narrow therapy, the less exposure other microbial bugs in your body have to, to go resistant on you. So less antibiotics, you would theoretically think that resistance factors uh, would not enhance themselves as quickly. And thank you for that. Um, <clears throat> Dr. Barreco, thank you for your presentation and for your time here today. And I also want to thank um, Beer Murillo for their underwriting today's educational webcast. And I wanna remind audience members that any questions that weren't addressed today, the speaker will address them via email using your uh, registration information. Um, thank you again, and we would like to hope to see all of you next time. Bye-bye.